What's going on, man? It's Josh again. Going in for discussion number two. Last discussion we were talking with an atheist, and basically we were talking about how reliable the scripture is. So we're doing some comparing. First in contrast, but today um, we're a little bit off the topic. I'm actually going to discuss um, the deity of Jesus, and I'm putting this out there because um, there is a growing number in religious cults, namely the, the Watchtower Society or what we know as the Jehovah's Witnesses, who claim um, that Jesus isn't God. And so we're just going to. Uh, you know, last discussion was I really got into the historicity and all all the facts and stuff. But really, today I just want to use the Bible. I want to use the Word of God because I think the Word of God is sufficient enough to defend itself in this case. Um, there is there is times, of course, when we can use out you know resources and other sources outside the Bible, which they all have their purpose. But today. Um, I'm going to use the scripture because I believe this, uh, the scripture is sufficient enough uh, for me to prove that Jesus is indeed God. Um, you can use the Watchtower. It, it doesn't matter. The Watchtower Society Bible, which um, their translation, the Jehovah's Witness translation of their Bible, is by far the most inaccurate. However, they will say it's the most accurate. It's fine. Um, they're entitled to that. So please, if you have that one, if I do have any Jehovah's Witness watchers out there, please have your Bibles ready. Um, but I want to first go over some things outside um, the norm. First off, let's talk about Jesus. You know, let's compare our Jesus, the Christianity version of Jesus, Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox version of Jesus in comparison to the Jehovah's Witness version. Um, the Jehovah's Witness version does say that Jesus did not die on a cross, that he died on a pole or on a stake. Uh, the Greek word translated cross in many Bible uh, terms literally means one piece of timber. This does come from what does God require from us in published in 1996. Um, so basically, uh, what was the one piece of timber? That was used in Jesus' day. That was my question. And when I did the research, um, we have scholars um, who aren't Christians, by the way. These are just uh, scholars over in the Middle East that will say um, the word, the Greek word staros in, in the New Testament was a pole sunk into the ground with a crossbar fastened to it, giving it a T shape. So it's probably a little different than what our, you know, our common view of the crosses where we have like goes up and down and then side to side in the middle it was more of a T the the cross part was actually on top and the cross uh, often the word cross referred only to um, the cross bar itself so this is from historical scholars that study um, the Roman crucifixion and what happened so and we also have archaeological evidence you can google archaeological evidence on ancient crosses and and crucifixions um, but when you say he was to a pole, uh, my question is, did Jesus have one nail or two nails in his hands? And it doesn't make sense to have him if, if he was tied, uh, if he was on a stake, timber. Um, it doesn't make any sense at all. He would have to be on a cross. Uh, on a cross for that because there was two nails in his hand because they even asked Thomas in John chapter 20 verse 25 he said to look at um, the holes in my hands plural um, and so now another thing too is if it was just a pole then where was the room for the sign that was nailed above his head um, again, in Matthew 27, 37, it said above, it said there was a charge that was against him, Jesus, um, king of the Jews. And so, also, our boast is uh, what Paul said in Galatians 6, 14. He said that our boast, uh, we should not have a boast except that that is at the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, again, it wasn't a stake, it wasn't a pole, it was a cross. We just got to get that straight, just because of the fact that 
I'm just having some difficulties with where they come up with the poll being used there. Um, let's talk about uh, Jehovah, and let's compare Jehovah with Jesus. If you go to um, 1 John 3.20, Psalm uh, 147.5, um, you're going to find that it says that Jehovah, in their translation, knows all things. Well, you go to Jesus, knows all things too. In John 16.30, um, and we're just going to read there real quick. I'm just turning there with my scripture. I love John 16. It's good stuff. And 1630 says here, his disciples said to him, see, now you are speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now we are sure, we are sure, they're confident, what's the next sentence? That you know all things and have no need for anyone that should question you. By this we believe that you came from God. Because only God is all-knowing. So they knew that Jesus came from God because Jesus is all-knowing. Jesus came from God and shares the same DNA as God because he is God. Um, because he's the son, literal son of God, and or whatever you want to call it, he, he is God. Uh, Jehovah is the only one that knows the hearts of all men. First Kings 8.39 will tell you that. And so is Jeremiah 17.9. Only the Lord, only the Lord because 17.9 says, the heart is desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. So it is only God that knows the heart, Jehovah God. But when you go to, um, gosh, you can go anywhere. But John, let's say John 2.24. So we're going to scoot on back to John again. And let's go to chapter 2, verse 24. And it says here, <clears throat> We'll start at 23. It says, Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in him and his name, excuse me, in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. And he had no need that anyone should testify of men. For he knew what was in man. The same goes with Matthew 9 4. You know, he knew what was in man. He defines what's in man in Mark chapter 7. He tells what the heart's condition is. Because he can. He can make those claims, and he can say those things, and he can say he knows what's in man because he's all-knowing. He didn't say he, he knew it was in one man or, or many men. He knows what's in man, period. He's all-knowing. It's an attribute only given to Jehovah God. Um, and the list can go down. Jehovah is our sanctifier. Only Jehovah God. Exodus 31.13 says that Jehovah God only sanctifies us. Then Jesus sanctifies us. Hebrews 10.10. 10. Go there and read it for yourself. Hebrews 10.10. 10. Jesus sanctifies us. Jehovah God is our peace. Judges 6.23. I found that one. Um, Jesus is our peace. Ephesians 2.14. He made peace. God. With his blood. Hello. You know, Jehovah is our righteousness. Jeremiah 23, 6. Yeah, well, Jesus is a righteousness too. It's 1 Corinthians 1, 30. So you, you can look at it all the way down the list. Jehovah is our healer. That's Exodus 15, 26. And then, of course, Jesus heals us. And that's Acts 9, 34. Jehovah God dwells in us. 2 Corinthians 6, 16. Jesus dwells in us. Romans 8, verse 10. Jehovah is the giver of life. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 32, 39. And no one is allowed to be snatched out of Jehovah's hands. But Jesus is the giver of life, and no one will be snatched out of his hands. John 10, 28. Who doesn't know that passage? Come on. Jehovah's voice is like the roar of rushing waters. That's Ezekiel 43, 2. Jesus' voice was like the sound of rushing waters. Revelation 1, 15. <laughs> they, have a, they have the exact same voice. That's pretty weird. Jehovah is present everywhere. Proverbs 15, 3, Jeremiah 23, 24, 1 Kings 8, 27. And 1 Kings 8, 27 says that the heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain the glory of God. God's glory is everywhere. So, when you look to Jesus, um, Jesus is omnipresent too. John 1, 48, Matthew 18, 20, Matthew 28, 20. Um, Jesus is at all places at once. And Jesus, and Paul even says Jesus is all in all. I mean, he fills all things as well. He is the all-sufficient. Jehovah's nature does not change. Malachi 3, six says that God does not change. And then you go to Hebrews. Um, 
Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, and it tells us that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know? And uh, Jehovah is the only God we are to serve. That's 2 Kings 17, 35. But Jesus is to be served. Colossians 3, 24. Let's go to it real quick because we're going to go into a little bit of a discussion on this. Who is to be served? Because we know in Revelation when the angels were being worshipped there from John, the angels rebuked John. But anytime Jesus worship, was worshipped from John, Jesus never rebuked any worship. Jesus never rebuked any worship from anyone. Come to think of. Not one time. Jesus always received worship. Even John. In the book of John, Thomas said, My Lord and my God in John 20, 20 verse 28. And um, that was an act of worship. He realized Jesus was God. He didn't say, he wasn't saying, oh my God. I mean, come on, guys. You could get around that sentence, that clause, whatever you want, but read in the actual Greek. He's saying it's Jesus. He's making a definitive statement in the Greek, which the structure only allows him to give Jesus the credit in that context. You cannot take that out of context. Jesus is called God in that verse. I've never heard a Jehovah's Witness repeat that verse. You can't. They will make up an excuse, or they'll say, well, Jesus isn't God, let's go to this verse. But when you go to that verse, and we're going to go to one more later, which will blow Jehovah's Witnesses' mind. Okay. So, oh, where was I going again? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Okay. Let's see here. Colossians 3.24 Good stuff. Good stuff. It's good. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. So what does it say? Paul speaking to the Colossus Church. He's saying you guys are serving the Lord Christ. But you're only supposed to have one master, Christ himself. You're not to serve anything else besides God. You have a choice. God, or anything that comes before God, which is the master of your life, which is an idol, not of God. So Jesus puts himself at the same standing where Paul says that he has served. He's telling the Colossus Church, good job for serving the Lord Christ. Which he's called Lord there, by the way. Lord, one Lord. Ephesians tells us that, that there's only one Lord and one baptism. But, um, God's name is Jehovah or Yahweh. You know, we can argue that one. Jehovah is not a closer translation. Um, Jesus has Jehovah's name, though, in John 17, 11, you know, or John 8, 58, where he says, I am, that's Egoi me, which is the same meaning where in Exodus 3.14, where, Jesus, where uh, Jehovah God was standing with the burning bush, the burning bush, and then Moses is like, hey, who do I say or who sent me? And uh, Jehovah God just said, hey, I am. Tell him, I am sent you. I am all sufficient. I am, I am always. I am God. I am, I am here. Jesus said the same thing, and the Pharisees picked up stones to stone him because they knew what he was doing and what he was saying. You can argue that context all day long. You can add words to that context all day long, but they were pissed. Why were they angry? They were angry because Jesus claimed to be God. John 8, 58. Before Abraham was, I am. The next verse says they went to pick up stones to stone him. Think about that. Jehovah is the mighty God, Jeremiah 32, 17 through 18. But there is only one true God, 1 Timothy 1, 17, and Isaiah 44, 8. And in Isaiah, it's funny because he says that he doesn't, in, in chapter, I believe it's chapter 24, I can go there real quick. But he says he doesn't even share his glory with anyone else. And then J Jesus prays in John 17. He says, may I receive the glory that I share with you before the foundation of the earth. But Jehovah says in Isaiah, I don't share my glory with anyone. So what's up with that? I don't know about you, but uh, I got some questions for Jehovah's Witness. Because this just isn't adding up. 
I'm the first and the last. There's none before me. There's no God before me, nor is there one after me. I mean, straight up. And he says, I am your God and your Savior. But Jesus is called Savior how many times? In the New Testament? Multiple times. But there is no other God or Savior besides me. Isaiah 45. I am the only Savior. There is no other. There is no other. He says it. He's so adamant about it. I don't know how many times he says it. Unbelievable. He says it a lot. The point is, there is only one God. So how can Jesus be God? Well, folks, how can he not be God? How can they not share in the same uniqueness? Who are we to put limits on God on what he can be and what he can't? When we say, how can God be three but yet one, and when we use the words, how can, in the same context with God, my, your faith in God isn't even real. God can be 50,000 trees and a lion and a horse and an apple all at the same time if he wants to be. He's God. There's nothing too hard for God. God is not limited by man's comprehension or thinking. Therefore, man's futile thinking, man's so-called sophisticated thinking is nothing but a joke in comparison. It's like trying to explain the internet to an ant. Seriously, are you really going to try to define God's triune nature? You know, you can look at aspects like yourself, you know, or like me. Um, I'm Joshua the brother. I'm Joshua the son, you know, and I'm Joshua the cousin. I have a cousin, I have a brother, and I have parents. I'm three different, I take three different roles to each of those people, but I'm still one person. God can do three different roles and still unite himself with one because he can't. One times one times one still remains one. You can add water to the equation and say that water is all a liquid, a gas, and a solid, but still has the same substance. It's still the same thing. It's no different. They, meet, they might each have different roles, and they might each do different things, but it's all the same water. You know, I just, uh, a triangle has three points, but it still connects at all three points. How different is it just doesn't make any sense that people can define and limit God because they don't understand him. And they'll change the Bible to do the same thing. They don't understand scripture, so they change it. Well, I'm going to take you to scripture, and I'm going to make you use the Jehovah's Witness version of the scripture. Because this scripture, I've never in my life, talking to Jehovah's Witness, ever had a Jehovah's Witness answer the scripture. I do not want to hear a bunch of responses back from Jehovah's Witnesses telling me Jesus isn't God, blah, blah, blah. That's, I already know you guys know that. You don't have to tell me anything new. What I'm asking you to do, though, is I'm asking you to look at three verses in this order and tell me what it says. And I want you guys to go to Revelation 1.8. And it says here, Revelation 1.8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Okay? And the Lord says, Who is and who was to come, the Almighty. Now, we believe that's Jesus speaking. Now, you say it's not. You say it's Jehovah God. Why? Because Jehovah God is the Alpha and the Omega. Well, guess what? I'm going to side with you. I'm going to give that to you. I'm going to give you guys the extra lead on this. I'm going to follow along with you. I'm going to see where this goes. Because you guys are saying right here in this context in Revelation 1a that only Jehovah God here is the Alpha and the Omega. Jesus is not Alpha and the Omega because Jesus was a created being. Okay. So let's go to Revelation. We're going to stay in the book of Revelation. So we know you guys love the book of Revelation. It's probably one of the most read books, the most misunderstood book in your, in your cult. But when you go to Revelation... Uh, let's go to 22.13. And it says here, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Again, who is this speaking here? My Bible clearly states it's Jesus speaking. Well, you guys think it is. You guys think it's Jehovah God. Well, I'll give it to you. I'll give you this last one. I can't. I can't argue with it. It does seem like it's Jehovah God. I mean, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Sounds pretty legit. Jehovah God. Okay. So, who's the, who's the first and the last here? Jehovah God. The beginning and the end? Jehovah God. 
the Alpha and the Omega. We get the point. It's Jehovah God. It's not Jesus. Jesus was not the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and Omega. Okay. So we'll go there and we'll settle with that. But I just have one more verse for you guys to look at. And I want you guys to give me a little insight to this. Okay. And we're going to start at verse 15. And it says, his feet, oh, sorry, chapter 1, verse 15, Revelation 1, 15. It says, his feet were like fine brass. It's funny how John sees his feet, physical feet. I thought, I thought the Father was spirit that doesn't have flesh and bone. Luke 24 says, spirit has not flesh and bone. 1 Timothy 1.13 says, God is invisible. John 4.24 says, God is spirit. I mean, the list goes on. God is not physical like us. He came in the physical manifestation through the personal work of Jesus Christ, the God himself, the Father, the spiritual. So if this was talking about the Father, obviously this is weird because it says his feet. But let's follow along anyways. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as sound of many waters. Hmm. Okay. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining at its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand, hand physical, on me and said to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Let's stop. That verse there, let's say it's not Jesus. Let's say it's Jehovah God with physical attributes. Let's say it's Jehovah God with physical feet and hands. It's fine. I'll give you that. Because right here it says it's the first and the last. If he's the first and the last, there's only one that's the first and the last. And I can agree with you. It is Jehovah God. But what about the next verse? I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forever. Amen. Same person speaking. No one changed. No one took different roles. Father didn't take a break and say, Jesus, can you take over speaking for me? Same person throughout the whole context. He laid his right hand on me and said, I'm the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. When did Jehovah God die? It says the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega died. Verse 18. So that's going to end it for today. I hope that you guys are just uh, seeking out the truth. Believe what you know, know what you believe. And uh, hitting back, Jehovah's Witnesses out there, if you guys can answer this verse for me. Thanks. God bless you.